So welcome to Inclusion Through the ADA. Today, we're going to talk about the interactive process under the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Job Accommodation Network, as well as digital accessibility. So this webinar is hosted by WorkVision Consulting. WorkVision Consulting is a boutique diversity, equity, and inclusion consulting firm. We create strategic DE&I plans, provide training and implementation, and assess compensation equity. A little bit about me, my name is Jocelyn. My pronouns are she, her. I'm coming to you from Concord, California, which is in the San Francisco Bay Area and on stolen Ohlone land. And um, today I will be doing picture descriptions for anyone who is blind or sight impaired. And we also have closed captions on the webinar today. So here we have a picture of me. I'm standing in front of a blue door wearing a blue dress. Um, it's a picture about mid-arm mid up and I have pink lipstick on. And if you don't hear me do a description on a slide, um, that's because there is no picture and it's just text. And I will be reading all the text on the slides. So today, some ground rules. Um, we will be uh, having the Q&A as well as the chat available. So if you would like to introduce yourself in the chat, feel free to do that. If you want to include your LinkedIn profile to connect with anyone that's on this webinar, that would be great. Um, but we do ask that you be respectful and don't include any spam or any hateful language or anything else um, that might be disrespectful within the chat or the Q&A. Um, if you do have questions, put those in the Q&A. We have Karen here who will be monitoring that Q&A and she can um, shout those out during the webinar or at the end, we'll have a little bit of time for questions as well. If there's any questions we don't get to during the presentation, because we do have a lot of content today that we're gonna be going through in this 30 minute presentation, we will answer those questions afterwards. So we're, we'll either reach out to you directly or we may include those answers in the follow-up email if they seem relevant to the larger group. The other ground rules include being open. So be open to learning today. Hopefully you will find a lot of really valuable information. Also acknowledge your privilege. So doing diversity, equity, and inclusion work, it's important to acknowledge where you have privilege and maybe where that privilege can help to further this work. And then lastly, always keep learning. No one knows everything, but together we know a lot. I just love that because, um, you know, on this topic, there's a lot of pieces that I know about the ADA and disability inclusion, but there's a lot of things that I don't know. And so today on the webinar, we have Abler, um, Kim Casey, and John Samuel are here, and they're going to talk a little bit more about the digital accessibility piece. And I'm really excited to have them share their information as well as the services that they provide. This week, the Americans with Disabilities Act turned 31. So on Monday was the 31st anniversary of the ADA. And I'm gonna talk about what the ADA includes. What is the ADA? The ADA is a civil rights law that was implemented to prohibit discrimination against people with disabilities. And there are five titles in the law. Today, we will focus on employment, and communications. So for employment, this is ensuring equal employment opportunities in the workplace. This includes candidates and employees. And for employees, we want to look at all aspects of the life cycle. So that's from the onboarding to training to promotions and much more. So that's going to be everything within the employee life cycle. Here we have a picture of a woman. She is white with light brown hair and she is working on her laptop. She's wearing headphones and she's sitting with her dog who she is petting. Next I'll talk about the communications piece. So this includes features such as telephone relay services, closed captioning, audio descriptions and more. This is looking at all the different ways that we communicate and ensuring that they're accessible. So we also call this digital accessibility. And this overlaps with workplace accessibility because we wanna ensure 
that the systems that we're using to communicate with employees are accessible. So things like we want to make sure our website is accessible for employees to use, as well as the employment application, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Here we have a picture of a person with um, it's a picture of their hands and they're using an assistive device on their computer. So what is a disability? Today, we're gonna use the context of the ADA to define what a disability is. There are a lot of different ways we can define disabilities and historically that has changed over time but we're gonna stick with this definition for today. So in the context of the ADA, disabled is a legal term versus a medical one. And the ADA defines a person with a disability as someone who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. What is a disability? There are different types of disabilities. And here I've um, put six categories that we can put them into. The first being physical and mobility disabilities. Next, blindness or sight impaired. Then we have deafness or hard of hearing. We have cognitive disabilities, psychological disabilities, and lastly, invisible or chronic illnesses. So with employment, providing equal employment opportunities is the law but it is also important for true inclusion at work. So we know that 61 million adults in the United States live with a disability and many of those people with disabilities are unemployed or underemployed. And this can be because of barriers to entry into the workforce or once they get in the workforce, they may have you know, things that they can't do with parts of their job they can't accomplish because they're not being accommodated properly. Here we have a picture of a group of four coworkers. They are at a bar enjoying beers together. They, um, some of them have physical disabilities we can see. One is in a wheelchair and one just has one leg. Next, I wanna talk about the interactive process. So under the ADA, the interactive process is required when an employee or candidate comes to you and asks for a disability, or if you notice that a disability may be needed. And so I'll talk a little bit about some examples of interactive processes that I've done with real employees. These examples are real and most of the details are as they were. Um, however, I have changed their names. So this example is Fran, who works as a marketing director for a small company that has 45 employees and an open office floor plan. She typically answers the phone on speaker to be able to use her hearing aids. Now this um, accommodation was brought um, just at the beginning of this year. And so most of the, for all of the employees had been pretty much working 100% remotely for the previous year. And so when Fran was working remotely at her home, she was able to answer her phone on speaker and take her calls that way and leave her hearing devices in. But when she had been at the office, she had had to remove her hearing aids and to be able to answer the phone. And then she wasn't able to hear a lot of the phone call. And so she had requested an accommodation for when the company returns to the office to be able to use a room that um, has been used for meetings and it's a two person room to be able to do um, her phone calls and use that as her office versus having a desk in the open office. And so we met, um, I met with Fran about four different times and we discussed the, um, you know, the impairment that she was having, the issue she was having with answering the phone in the open office. And then what were some of her ideas to be able to correct it? And using the office was one of them. We also discussed continuing to have her work from home, either 100% or part of the time. And so um, after we met the initial time, I came back to Fran with some other ideas. So we talked about things like um, telephonic services. So potentially having an app on her phone or something that could translate the call and what the person was saying. 
We also talked about different devices that might be able to hook up to her hearing aids from her phone directly. And we tried out some of these different things. What we ended up deciding on, because the, um, the devices that connected to the hearing aid gave her feedback. And so we decided that having her use a small room was the best accommodation. And so when she goes back to the office in September, she's gonna be using that room three days a week and then working from home the other two. And that was the accommodation we came to. The next interactive process I wanna talk about is this employee who had back pain. Oh, and I'm sorry, let me describe. So this picture um, of Fran is a, a white woman with blonde hair and she has a hearing aid um, that we can see. It's the picture of the back of her ear. And then she's also wearing gold earrings. So next is employee with back pain. Um, his name is Will. He works at a company of about 2000 people in the IT department. And he has to travel with equipment to several different buildings during the day. Will provides a doctor's note that states um, that he has work-related back pain from carrying the equipment, and it's also aggravated um, by uh, doing work at his desk. And so with this, Will had provided a doctor's note. So one of the things is that um, with the interactive process, depending on your employer process and policies, you can require a doctor's note for all ADA accommodations or some of them. With the previous one I talked about, we didn't require it because we knew that Fran was hearing impaired, used assistive devices, the hearing aids, and it didn't really help us in any way to get an additional doctor's note about that. However, with this example, because Will's back pain um, it's something that we can't really see how it's impacting him and there's a lot of different accommodations. So it's helpful to have this doctor's note. The doctor's note suggested that uh, the employer provide a specific backpack, um, a specific type of backpack to be able to carry the equipment as well as a new desk chair to help with the aggravation that's happening while the employee is sitting at their desk. We also did an ergonomic adjustment. So we assessed the height of the desk and the computer and everything to make sure that it worked properly for Will. In this, um, the first meeting I had with Will, we talked about what his recommendations were based on the doctor's note and that he would look up some items that he thought would be helpful with the backpack and the chair. And he sent those to me. And then we looked at those items and they were quite expensive. So what I did is I took that information and I found some equivalent items that were a little less expensive and proposed those to Will. And we were able to agree on a backpack and a chair that would work for this back pain. So with requesting an accommodation, as I mentioned, these two examples were people who came to the company and said, I need an accommodation, but it's not always that simple. Sometimes employees will say other things that might be indicators that you should ask more questions to find out if they need an ADA accommodation. So some examples are an employee saying, I am having trouble making it to work on time. I'm having trouble sleeping. I have pain when I sit at my computer. I'm have, having trouble hearing in meetings, or in a place that is suddenly not producing the quality of work that you're used to. These are all things that could indicate someone might need an ADA accommodation. And so when you're asking more questions and these things come up, you want to make sure you understand what you can ask the employee and what you can't. So one of the things when going through the interactive process is that an employee is not required, well, an employee or candidate is not required to provide a diagnosis. And so they don't have to say something like, I have cancer or I have sleep apnea. They don't have to provide that information, but they do sometimes have to provide what accommodations they might need, or they may, as I mentioned, have to provide a medical note um, from the doctor describing what um, the impairment is or what accommodations might be needed. 
And so with that, it's important to know that someone doesn't even need to have a diagnosis to be able to go through the ADA interactive process. So an, a, a personal example is that I have chronic pain as well as um, an unknown allergy to food. And so in the past, I've gone through a process to get intermittent leaves of absence um, when I had a flare up of this allergy. And so that's something where I've, I've gone to the doctor and they haven't been able to diagnose what is wrong, um, but they know that this symptom is happening. So an employee that has symptoms but doesn't have a diagnosis can still go through this process. The other piece that's important to note is an employee can disclose their diagnosis if they want to. You don't have to stop them from doing that. So it's really their prerogative of what they want to share with you, um, but they're not required to and they should never feel like they have to. So another piece of the ADA is that um, it states that the accommodation must be a reasonable accommodation. So what accommodations are reasonable? What this means is it's a mod modification or adjustment to the application process or to the job, and it cannot pose an undue hardship on the employer. Now, this undue hardship is a little bit vague in the ADA, and it's that way on purpose because the employer has to prove something would be an undue hardship, and generally the recommendation is to accommodate, um, and most things are, are not really considered undue hardships. With that, um, as I mentioned with the example for Will, there was equipment that was being requested by him that was a little bit more expensive than we thought we needed to spend. And so we did work to look for something that was less expensive. But if we hadn't found anything, we would have provided that equipment. Um, the equipment can be assistive devices to do the job, but it does not need to be a personal assistive device. So an example of that is like a cane or hearing aids. And as I mentioned, an accommodation can be a leave of absence. This can be intermittent or continuous. Now, some companies may have other medical leaves of absence that apply where it wouldn't necessarily need to be under the ADA, for example, family and medical leave. Um, but if that type of leave of absence does not apply because the employer is too small or exempt for another reason, it's great to be able to look at the ADA and provide leaves of absence there. Job descriptions are a really important part of this process, and I'm always talking about how important job descriptions are for so many things that employers do. Um, but having job, uh, job descriptions that are up to date, just that describe the physical requirements of a job and the day-to-day -day activities are an important part of this process. So the reason is we wanna be able to see what are the physical requirements that the person isn't able to accomplish or um, what are the day-to-day -day activities and are these gonna be things that we are able to accommodate by maybe moving those activities to someone else. Um, and so this can be really helpful when looking at all of that. Here we have a gentleman sitting at a table. He is blind and he is also black. He's wearing headphones and he is reading a book in braille. All right, so we talked about the ADA and all the great um, things with the interactive process, all the different ways that you can apply that. And I wanna mention a really great tool, whether, you've, um, whether you're familiar with the ADA or not, this is an excellent tool for people who are going through the interactive process. It's also an excellent tool for people with disabilities that want to learn what accommodations might work for them. So the Job Accommodation Network, also called JAN, and the website for this is askjan.org. It is the A to Z directory for disabilities and accommodations. As I mentioned, JAN is great for employers and individuals. You can go on and search for a disability. JAN gives you definitions, how to accommodate the disability, questions to ask the employee if you're an employer, as well as accommodations by limitation and by job function. 
So this is the reason that having those up-to-date job descriptions is so important. You can look at the different job functions that someone's doing and see how to accommodate the disability. And here we have a woman who is reading a book and she has a dog sitting on her lap. She has dark hair. The next resource I wanna mention is the WCAG or the Web Content Accessibility Guide. This is a guide and also the benchmark for digital accessibility. It explains the different ways that uh, digital pieces, you know, whether it's a website or videos, how they can become more accessible. Some examples of digital accessibility are captions or audio descriptions for videos, ensuring contrasting colors and color is not used as the only visual means of conveying something. This is for someone who might be colorblind. Ensuring web pages can, read, can be read by a screen reader for people who are blind or visually impaired. Ensuring that applications are not digitally, um, or sorry, applications are digitally accessible and not unintentionally excluding candidates. So making sure that if um, somebody is going through and filling in the fields, there's um, a, the screen reader can work for that, all kinds of things in that area. And so this is where I'm gonna hand it over to Kim Casey, who is the accessibility consultant for Abler. And she is going to talk about their amazing um, products that they offer as well as their services and what Abler does. Thank you, Jocelyn. Hi, everyone. I'm Kim Casey. I'm an accessibility uh, director of accessibility at Abler. And Abler was born out of LC Industries, which is one of the largest employers of people who are blind and visually impaired. They are um, in the Durham, North Carolina area and <clears throat> historically have employed people for manufacturing jobs. And as technology changes, that means there's more technology jobs available for people who are blind and visually impaired. So they decided to form Abler, uh, which would focus on three things. One would be to eliminate the digital divide. So Jocelyn just talked of a couple of digital accessibility uh, examples. We, um, we will go in and check your website or your web, uh, mobile application or any digital resource that you might have and make sure that it is accessible for uh, people of all abilities. Uh, we also work um, a little bit with changing mindsets of people, people and organizations, and that includes uh, we have training modules, little training courses, and we also provide disability inclusion consulting services. And we, our third area of focus is creating pathways for employment. So just as it's difficult as a company trying to figure out how do I hire people with disabilities, it's also difficult for people with disabilities to really realize their full potential and understand what jobs are out, jobs are out there for them. So we have a couple of programs that help um, high school age students and uh, uh, working age individuals to find jobs that suit their abilities. Uh, next slide. And so the thing about Abler, obviously, since we're created from a company that already um, is, is one of the largest employers of people with disabilities, we too have um, people with disabilities on our team, just about 70% of us. And we employ a human centric approach. So a lot of um, disability consulting services use automated services and, and kind of stop there. What we like to do is have people with the actual disabilities test the digital resources or um, try out a job or something, anything, just to get a actual user experience and so that we can provide that end user perspective to people. And so, you know, a lot of times we'll, we'll get feedback from customers and they'll say, you know, I've never thought about uh, my website like that. And now that I am, I can't ever look at it the same. So it's kind of a fun process that we go we kind of create a partnership with everybody that we work with so that they understand why it's important to make things accessible uh, next slide and so we have a course um, kind of to make it easy for people wondering i know there are a few of you on the call today um, starting to look into hiring people with disabilities and we've put together a course um, we've 
grabbed experiences and lived experiences of, you know, over 30 internal and external reviewers um, to make sure that we captured all of the ins and outs and just kind of to give you a good big picture, but with enough detail so that you have action items to start moving this um, towards, towards a finished product. Next slide. A little bit more about the course. Um, it'll teach about the benefits of disability inclusion and best practice for disability etiquette. So if you're, um, you know, it's all just the, the foundation of understanding, you know, um, everything that goes into um, disability inclusion. And so we have the course includes 84 lessons, 32 videos, 12 downloadable handouts, five recorded slow sh slideshow presentations, five quizzes and audio recordings. Uh, next slide. And we would like to extend, um, if anyone's interested, we're extending a 50% discount um, until the end of August um, to purchase our course. And so you can go through those modules at your own pace um, and just learn a lot more about the subject. And I think, oh, I'm at my five minutes. So if you'd like to contact us, you can visit the Abler website. Um, I did not list out the, the link there. Um, Jocelyn, are you gonna be distributing this presentation? Okay, so everybody can have the link. Our website just for reference is abler360.com. And then from there, you can find information about our inclusion course, or you can uh, email us at info at abler360.com. And thank you all so much. Thank you, Kim. That's so awesome. I just want to piggyback on saying that the course is really amazing. I was able to go through it and I learned so much from it. So I highly recommend checking out that course if you're interested in learning more about disability inclusion. Could be a great thing to do with your team and be able to discuss the ways that you can incorporate that into your DE&I practices. So I will be sending out a, an email to follow up and I'll include all of the relevant links that are in the presentation as well as a copy of the presentation and a recording. So I know we're um, at 1030, so understand if people have to hop off, but I just have a few more slides if people can stay for you know, four or five minutes. And um, of course, this recording will be available. So if you aren't able to stay on, you can, you can watch it later. So just a little bit more about Work Vision Consulting Services. So as I mentioned, um, our services, they are in three buckets. We do diversity, equity, and inclusion audits. We do DE and I training, as well as compensation equity audits. And if you are interested in working with us, you can email info at workvisionconsulting.com. You can also go to our website, which is workvisionconsulting.com, and there's a contact page that you can fill out. If you do want to work with us, um, how to work with a consultant, it's a very easy process. We typically do a 30 minute discovery call to assess your needs, then create a proposal of statement of work. And then we have a 30 minute meeting to review it and make any changes to that proposal of statement of work. I also wanted to mention an upcoming event that we have. This is our DE&I and HR happy hour. We've hosted three of these so far and they've been fantastic. It's groups, uh, it's a group of DE&I professionals, HR professionals, as well as people that are in adjacent fields. And they all, we all get together and we talk about different questions that come up for people. And it's just a really great sounding board if you have questions around these spaces and want to have an amazing group to talk about them with. We've discussed um, DE&I topics. We've also discussed returning to work was a big one. Um, we've talked about troubles with hiring, things like that. And the, the groups just have such great resources and knowledge that we share. And it's a great way to meet people in the industry as well. And we do these virtually. And um, this upcoming one is going to be Thursday, August 26th at 5 p.m. Pacific time, 8 p.m. Eastern time. If you're interested in attending this happy hour, feel free to email info at workvisionconsulting.com and I will add your email address to the invitation. 
So with that, I'll see if we had any questions in the Q and A. Don't think we had some stuff in the chat, but nothing in the Q and A. So feel free if you want to introduce yourself in the chat. Still, I'll leave this open for just another minute. Um, and thank you so much for everyone for joining us. Um, hopefully you got some great information and thank you so much to Abler for joining and offering that 50% discount on your course. It's such an amazing course and I highly recommend that people check that out.